We're going to start the second part of the session right now. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, present uh, this afternoon two of my partners in crime uh, that were able to make this, uh, this whole symposium come here to Dallas. And that's uh, Lola and Eugenio, as well uh, as the other three pillar, which is um, um, Diana coming from uh, the University of uh, February the 3rd in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So we're going to, from the other shore, narratives and perspective of Spanish art and Latin American art. We're going to talk about this session number two. The presenters of these sessions are the three constituents members of the research project Narraciones de lo Moderno. As you may remember from this morning, this project aims to, award, uh, to raise awareness to the existence of narrative frameworks in art history and to study how these narratives have shaped the way in which art history has been systemized and transmitted. More than taking a position for or against these narratives, their presentations will rather point out how some ideas and accounts have been conceived and how they have influenced the critical fortunes of our historical concepts, artists, or works of art. In the first presentation of this session, Eugenio Carmona, distinguished professor of art history from the University of Malaga, will analyze how some tacit agreements between art historians and museum curators through generations have created certain narratives, and how these never contested narratives came to be perceived as natural. Professor Carmona will base his analysis in the several Cubist works from the Meadows Museum collection. Our second speaker, Professor Diana Weschler, director of the Institute for Research and Art and Culture at the National University of Tres de Febrero in Buenos Aires, Argentina, will deal with a topic that may sound also familiar to art historians in Spain and the United States which is dealing with modern art, the supposed delay of the Latin American metro uh, metropolis in importing the agenda of modern art. To counter this well-established cliche, Professor Weschler will propose another way to address artistic processes occurring in Latin American art during the 20s and 30s from the perspective of other working hypotheses. The last speaker this afternoon will be Professor Maria Dolores Jimenez Blanco from the Computense University in Madrid she will focus in, in a specific study case, with the role played by James Johnson Sweeney in a certain definition of Spanish art this, in the scene of international modern art. After this presentation, we'll have the opportunity to, as we did this morning, ask questions and debate the different subjects. So please uh, join me in welcoming Eugenio Carmona, Professor Carmona. Dear friends and colleagues, it is truly, truly an honor to be present at this symposium. Our research project is a triangle, it's a trinity, two clever women and a man. I don't know why the only man in this project is the director or the head of this project, but perhaps for uh, bureaucratic reasons in Spain, you know, <laughs> it's uh, like this, but um, I'm the director, they are <laughs> Lola and Diana, the, the, the exponent of the results of the really the, the brilliant research. But like director of the Narrative of Modern Art project, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Margot Lang and all the staff to the Medias Museum, especially uh, Carmen Smith. And with the same degree of sincerity, express my thanks to the eminent professors of the Americas who out of their intellectual, intellectual and personal generosity have honored us with their presence. As a child, I was taught that expression of sincere gratitude should be short and explicit. So, thank you very much. The image you have before on your screen is the reproduction of a painting by Maria Blanchard from the Medios, Medios Museum collection. I believe that I have chosen a good beginning. The painting entitled Seated Woman was probably produced by the artist in 1916 or 1917. Maria Blanchard worked on it when she was about 35. 
At the time, she, she was a creator entering in her maturness, and at that time, she had a contract with the art dealer and gallerist Leon Rosenberg. Europe was at war. It was the time of the Great War, the First World War. Difficult times. Difficult times for everyone, but especially for artists. The Belle Epoque was vanishing. European and American society will never be the same again. Mentalities were changing. Social struggles will be come to the forefront. Countries will be erased from the maps and new ones drawn. Modernity, after hearing the bombs and experiencing the new weapons of war, began to doubt itself and began to doubt to, about the ideology of technical progress. But in Paris, the art war did not want to stop. In 1914 and 1915, the Cubist environment showed signs of the war impact. Some even considered too that Cubism died at this moment, at this time. But surprisingly, surprisingly, however, we discovered that the advocates of Cubism began to reorganize themselves. Moreover, too, those First World War years saw the arrival in Paris of a new wave of artists, many of whom, poets and painters, were Latin Americans. At all, all events, they are difficult times, and they are especially difficult times for women artists like Maria Blanchard, who were painting Cubism. In a Paris, Paris, with all Europe, all Europe at war, who had money to buy a Cubist painting? Under these circumstances, without doubt, Maria Blanchard's choice was a heroic option. But let's return to image. Recently, this painting by Maria Blanchard has been shown in Madrid. The work arose the interest of both experts and general public alike. The Maria Blanchard retrospective in the Reina Sofia Museum has really been a success. An enthusiastic public wants to reunite it with the brave woman painter of painting difficult to understand in difficult times. It is true that after so many years of gender studies, the academic world uh, in this attitude has spread, and it is true that after so many years of gender studies in the academic world, this attitude has spread, and the art loving general public is eager to acknowledge the merit of women artists. But the reunion with Maria Blanchard is not only based on gender question. Significantly, through Maria Blanchard, there has been a return to her Cubist period. However, faced with Maria Blanchard Cubism, several questions or several considerations became evident. For example, the Cubism of Maria Blanchard lasts a short time, from more or less the end of 1916 to the end of 1919, barely three years, roughly four years. Is that sufficient time to evaluate an important creative experience? Yes, in modern art it is. But in the second place, even while accepting this brevity, is the period between 1916 and 1920 the period in which the most significant Cubist uh, experiences is usually situated? Evidently not. And here was we are getting to the heart of the matter. We are, here we are getting closer to the peculiar relation between Cubism and modern art narratives. Should any of us to obtain and transmit basic information on Cubism, it's more than likely we will establish a series of parameters that appear totally reliable. The first of these parameters situate a chronological problem. The second identifies the main characters, and the third orders the structure of the account based in two core themes, analytical cubism and synthetic cubism. The first of these parameters is chronological and established that cubism is an experience that occurred between 1907 and 1914. We must remember that the work by Maria Blanchard that interests us was done in 1917, when 
was this chronological margin established for cubism? When Alfred Ball presented his first exhibition of modern art at the MoMA, cubism did not have this narrow chronolo chronological margins. Nor did cubism have such narrow margins when Cahier d'Art, a review in Paris, published the, its first narrative summaries of modern art. The same thing occurred in the early English and French historical narratives of modern art. Even in the resisting narrative created by Cambayre, Cubism went beyond the great world frontier. When this, systemati this systemati systematization happened then, it is difficult to pinpoint. But indeed, the chronological pairing or trimming of Cubism began when the paradigm of abstract art penetrated the mind of critic, historian, and museologists. That is, in the 50th or 20th century. The first Cubist retrospective exhibition held in France at the end of the 50th decade also imposed the same premises. And in my opinion, Clement Greenberg's writing, or who is Clement Greenberg, is, uh, is like a ghost, you know, <laughs> crossing around our, our speeches, no? but, but I think Clement Greenberg's writings, uh, published in the 50s, were especially influential, not only in the expression of some of, of its best known concepts, uh, it's in my opinion, Clement Greenberg is not influential in, in their concepts. I, th I think it's terrible to say that. No? It's really influential because, for example, in the case of Cubism, he said Cubism began in 1907 and finished in 1914. And like Clement Greenberg said that, that's a chronological margin for another experience very, very more longer in the time. Okay. At this moment, in this short chronology, Maria Blanchard's work was excluded from the history of Cubism. It was also the moment of exclusion of a large part of the work of Juan Gris or Jacques Lichtitz, even much of Picasso's works. And even much of Picasso's work disappeared from narratives of modern art. This was the moment of what we shall call second Cubism and the moment of the first important Latin American presence in the French capital. That's for me is important. The second Cubism disappeared, and the most important presence of Latin American artists disappeared too in the main narratives of the modern art. In this moment, only the Ada experience or return to order has been interested for art historian in recent years. The second parameter. The second parameter identifies the main characters. It confirms that Cubism was a creation of Picasso and Brack, of course. Also, some authors, especially Golding and Cooper, do introduce Juan Gris and Fernand Leger as leading characters in the Cubist experience. By doing this, by introducing Gris and Leger, they are following the premise established by Daniel Enrique and Bailer, expert theoretician on Cubist art and leading art dealer of Cubism. In his Kambayler uh, do this in the early writings, later compelling the view the way of Oscubism. These main characters are on the navel of the great Oscubism, but at the same time, we, we do not forget, at the same time, they were also those who worked for Kambayler's gallery. As can be seen from this, a conception of Oscubism emanates from Kambayler. And really, there is a Cubist Cam Valeriana narrative. As the leading characters are being put in place in the history of Cubism, other characters are being introduced. This having that name counter characters. The counter characters are those creators who, from 1911, were called Cubists and use the tit of Cubist in Paris salons. I refer to Glaze, Messanger, Lot, Marcusis, Lafernet, and the other, all the rest. Significantly, as Picasso and Brack was could not be seen in Cambayler's gallery, these creators were the ones who spread the term Cubism to the descent of modernism. This, important, this is important, 
during the first years of Cubist experience, between 1910 and 19, 1914, when Apollinaire, Allard, Olivier Urquart, and the other critics of Cubism talk of Cubism, they mention these people and consider them be among the leading characters. Later, however, these creators fell into disgrace. They were accused of a spurious Cubism, they were accused for, of formulating complicated theories, while their painting was only traditional painting with cubistic side forms. In the majority of the accounts about the cubism, these creators are considered bad painters and their cubism considered illegitimate. This comment has been respected for a long time, but saying this reflection has been lengthy, it's worthwhile concluding by saying that through not academic sphere, something is starting changing now, but recently now. The third parameter, the third parameter orders the structure of the account based in two core themes, analytical cubism and synthetic cubism. Of course, the perspective marks the third parameter is one of that has conditioned the narrative about the Cubism experience. And it's so because it arranged term chronological and conceptually. And because at the same time, it endows like, the Cubist experience with a certain sense of evolution. It's just some explain, it, if someone of us were to explain Cubism, uh, we say, to someone who do not know Cubism, we say, Cubism, see, Cubism history is uh, two, two phases, analytical Cubism, synthetic Cubism. Bam, but when expert look for where is this division situated, the expert don't find. What's, what's that? I remember a, a film of Lars von Trier, Manolo this morning was uh, uh, working about Lars von Trier, the, who is the boss all, all things, no? There are a lot of people working in our office, no? If they no, don't do uh, anything because the boss don't want. And who is the boss? When uh, they are looking for the boss, the boss don't exist. But this, this story is similar. <laughs> it's similar, no? We always talk about analytical and synthetic cubism, but when this systematization open, no? When, Okay, around the year 19, uh, 1985, in a brilliant study, Mark Roskin worried about the importance of the term and concept of analytical and synthetic. Christopher Gray before had it also so. Pierre Des also briefly doubted a possible meaning of analytical and synthetic Picasso cubism. Pierre Des is a, the, the best biographical Picasso writer. Uh, for, for him, it's very difficult to, 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 to talk about the Picasso's Cubism if they are two periods, analytical and synthetic. No? And the dictionary Picasso, Pierre Des, talk about this, no? about this problem. Okay. Christopher Green also questioned the matter, and in an excellent paper, Lynn Gangwell, an excellent paper of Lynn Gangwell on terminology of art criticism applied to Cubism in the beginning of the 20th century, the terms analytical and synthetic rarely appear. The concept of analytical and synthetic cubism has never been stable, nor have they been fixed by precise definition so much that the chronology of analytical cubism and synthetic cubism varies from one author to another. I would strongly like to emphasize this last point. They are, uh, our historian, they are not according with what is the chronological margin for analytical cubism and synthetic cubism. Moreover, the concepts of analytical and synthetic cubism are not truly working concepts in the account of cubism of the summary of reference of the time written by John Golding, Douglas Cooper, or Robert Rosenblum. You know, when I teach at Malay University on the other side, Cubism, and the student asks to me how I study analytical and synthetic Cubism, I refer to them, look at in the, in the canonical book by John Golding. 
My surprise was when the student returned to me, John Golden don't, don't speak about analytical and synthetical cubism. No? It's the, Roland Barthes uh, the, uh, talk about the doxa, this opinion. We have normally this opinion. We, we believe in this opinion, but never certificate what is the origin of this opinion. No? John Golden don't talk about that. No? It's a strange. No? Douglas Cooper, no? And Robert Rosenblum, no. <clears throat> and one of the most will the read reference books in the world of modern art by George Hill Hamilton, published originally by Pelican in 1977, the author merely, merely mentions the fact that some authors divide the Cubist experience in analytic and synthetic. He did a scan importance to this, to this possibility while clarifying in our revel, revelational footnote that this division of Cubism was proposed by Juan Gris as an internal system to explain on, on this work. The book is in Spanish, I'm sorry, no? Uh, um, uh, it's strange because this book from Pelican is the book um, with the, for Britain students and Spanish and French students in modern art. In this canonical uh, proposal, George Hamilton say, I don't believe in analytical and synthetical cubism. I, I can't explain why. If in the book, it's a Spanish student, our student cubism say, I, the author, I don't believe in synthetic and analytical cubism, why we are talking about analytical and synthetic, and synthetic cubism. No, it's a strange, it's a strange. Okay. In recent years, I studied that uh, carefully, no? In our research group, uh, uh, we are assumed many documents about cubism. At, in a sense, our work was overwhelmed by the recent and very important contribution of Mark and Leaf in Pat and Patricia Leighton. But we maintain our result with regard to considering the existence of analytical cubism and synthetic cubism somewhat is arbitrary. No? Uh, I prepared this devolution of the situation. No? I think if I read for you in my so bad English uh, this uh, complicated story about who is mm, talking about analytical, who is talking about synthetical, it's too complicated. I read the, 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 the little um, story. If, if someone of you want to, to know, no, I, I, I can to, to, to give you my paper. No? But now I think it's better to, to, to because I don't have the, the time. My, my colleagues are, are <laughs> later me, they press him for my time. No? <laughs> uh, but you know, the, it's the, in the first situation, uh, in the art critic talking about analytical cubism and synthetic cubism, uh, is in the art libre, an article of Roger, Roger Allard about messenger. And for here, analytical and synthetic is not two periods of cubism, it's two positions uh, for the cubist painter to analyze, to, to synthesize. No? Synthesize, but not in the same time, no, no, not two, two periods different, no. Um, after that, it's very complicated the situation because Kambayler, in a German review, the Weizenblatter <laughs> is talking about analytical and synthetical, but Kambayler named synthetic synthetic cubism uh, a group of pieces from Picasso that uh, in. In the next contribution of Cambayler to cubism story, uh, moved to, to be analytical cubism. No, Cambayler utilized the term, but it's changing in our in in every book. What is analytical or synthetic? Cambayler write in in the in the 1919. Maurice Reynal is talking about analytical and synthetical about Juan Gris. In 1921, Juan Gris start to work, start to, 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 to say in my work there are two periods, analytical and synthetical. And after that, uh, Cambaler in uh, returns to consider they are a new cubism in 1923, is the synthetic cubism starting by Juan Gris. No? 
The, uh, after that, too, the Thalenstein talk about analytical cubism is very complicated. And the point of of uh, of uh, the point of change of these possibilities is in the catalog of the Alfred Bart Mom exhibition cubism and abstract R. Alfred Mom, Alfred Bart say they are an analytical cubism and a synthetic cubism, but the division of Alfred Barr is not our uh, natural division now, because Alfred Barr considered decollage like analytical cubism. It's, it's difficult, no? but it's uh, like this. In the French reviews, Le Prix Nouveau and the other things, never talk about analytical and synthetic. Never, no? In this situation. OK. We can talk at length about the through or throughs of cubism, but the question is, the difference between analytical cubism and synthetic cubism may, to us, seem good or bad, right or wrong, useful or confusing, directional or perplexing. We can choose our option, but there can be no doubt that the division between analytical and synthetic cubism is a narrative invention. A narrative proposal that not all cubist experts will necessarily use. And from this, we can deduce something crucial. If the analytical synthetic dialectic is a narrative construction, other narrative construction should, could also exist that articulate or explain the cubist experience. And thus, if the analytical synthetic dialectic is a narrative construction, we can propose other welcoming and enriching narratives of narration that foster plurality. New narratives on cubism are emerging, especially from the better knowledge of, about the work of Angres and the other artists. Return to the pictures of Maria Blanchard. This painting is very similar, allow me to use the expression very similar, it's not a scientific expression, but we are in the France, no? This, this, this painting is very similar to this other painting of Juan Gris, to this other sculpture of Jack Lichips, to this other painting of Diego Rivera, which is a painting of André Lot, Jean Messanger, Albert Gilles, Gino Severini, it's very important for me to, to put Gino Severini in this sequence, and Emilio Petoruti. It's, it's for me too very, very important to, to put here Emilio Petoruti, Emilio Petoruti, and Rafael Barradas. Because I'm concluding now and I finish, if this period of art history disappear, this painter disappeared too. I, we have three Latin American painters, Diego Rivera, Emilio Petoruti, and Rafael Barradas. This is my case, no? This, but I can continue. Okay. What I do want with this? I want to say that Cubism did have a new lease of life, that Cubism had history within its history. And I also want to say if second Cubism, Cubism has not been identified before, because the narratives and paradigms devised around the Cubist experience have prevented it. And I also want to say the narrative of modern art must be revised, not for the pleasure of eliminating position or reestablish, but for the need to widen fields and presences that will return into what once rich and complex its own richness and complexity. Is I'm Spanish, and for me it's very important. Juan Gris, I would like to recognize the place of Juan Gris in this history. If I am Argentinian, and for me it's very important for my culture, it's very important Emilio Petoruti, I would like to be recognized the importance of Emilio Petoruti or Rafael Barradas. That's the problem, not other. I don't, uh, I, no, it doesn't matter to be a provincial teacher uh, needing modifying the structure of modern art for to be um, recognized or to be original. No, it's all, this term is this matter is with the is in relationship with the other question. Okay. 
I will extremely complicate here to draw up the details of this second cubism. To speak at length of this narrative will take too long, but it's worthly to make some general notes. It all began around 1916. Okay, I forgot to, it's Angel Zaraga, but Angel Zaraga perhaps is long of this possibility, but I like very much Angel Zaraga, the Mexican painter, no? is in this group too, okay. It began around 1916, and this is important to point out that before the second cubism start, a number of the artists mentioned made use of the collage. Therefore, the new cubist painting, they are well engaged in the can, or can be called post-collage cubist painting. That is important. This group of painting, now the collage. The group of painting now, how the collage transformed the same of artisticity and then definition of art, but they renounce of this possibility and they want to create a post-collage painting. That's the, the, the key for me of this operation. And after that, I believe in the, that the high point, the acme of the second cubism was in forming a new conception of the idea of pure painting. Apollinaire expressed this idea in his book Le Peintre Cubiste. However, since Apollinaire's stance was not considered influential in the theory of cubism, perhaps it has not been taken into sufficient consideration. The new cubist poor painting demands that the world should be evaluated from the, its plastic resources, but without relinquishing a last encounter with a recognizable figurative element that acted as a sign. The cubist poor painting is not therefore abstract painting. It is a degree zero of encounter between the purely plastic and the figurative. This is what Picasso attained in the summer of 1910 in Caracas. Sorry, it's here. And cada case, it was attending words on Brac and Greece and Legeo, Messanger, even Delaunay, no? in a first moment. Now, after the college experience in, in its second life, the concept of pure painting was redefined. Once again, we find a delicate and extreme balance between the allusion to the figurative and the abstract understanding of the work. But now, and the best work, the surface of the picture wants to be completely flat. It wants to be a construction of shapes, not a rhythmic vibration of rush stock on the canvas. The first cubist pure, paint, pure painting was aesthetically linked to the music. The second cubist pure painting was linked to architecture. There is also connection with the objective and with a free and orthodox way to un of understanding the geometry. Juan Gris understood this well and expressed it in his writings. <coughs> now, in the second cubist per painting, color and shape are united. The shape color unity is created. The shape are not facets of the object as they were in the first cubism. Now, they are abstract plastic unit working in the painting to culminate in a something figuratively, figurat figuratively recognizable. The inclination or insertion of plane in the shape color unity gave a sensation of space. But now, the sensation of space was not linking to a desire to represent the atmosphere as in the first cubism. Now, there was a desire to represent space and volume. It was, of course, difficult to create three-dimensional volume with flat paints, column construct, helped to create the sensation. Sometimes, by using these formulas, the creators of the second cubism tended towards abstraction, and this painting was difficult to the public to understand. No? It was very, it's for the, I think, in, for the public, it was, in this time, um, more easy to understand a pure abstraction, completely abstraction, or figurative. But a picture representing something but mm, reclaimed to be evaluated like a pure painting is a difficult situation for the public in the First World War, no? in, in these circumstances. Okay. We, we have in these circumstances the, the, the work of Juan Gris, 
really the, the leader of this possibility. Petoruti, Severini, Blanchard, Lipschitz, Messanger. Messanger in a, in a kind of position and another one. But other times, the promoters of the second cubism play with optical illusion. In this proposal, an abstract construction of shades with a reference suggesting a spatial or perspective sensation is assembled on the canvas. The object or reference were normally a table, but it could be also the floor of the room, vegetation in a garden, or an open air space. Metzanger was especially skillful in this type of compositions. Let us look at a specific construct between two works of the period. We will look at two landscapes, an usual subject in the cubist space. In a landscape date in 1915, uh, uh, now in the Meadows Museum, Picasso basically used the language resources we have described. But Picasso resolves the painting with a scenographic solution, and the elements used are extremely varied. This is, as Pierre de observed, certainly one of the Picasso's masterpieces. Picasso eloquently accomplishes a great work introducing a large number of elements and giving promi prominence to the decorative. On the contrary, the medium museum painting by Juan Gris is flat, retrained, contained, succinct, and precise. Searching for the sense. That's a, a way of the matter. Picasso is working in this direction. But Picasso is working, too, in a classic way. And is working, too, for Diaghilev and the ballets in a scenographical works. Picasso is uh, very, very uh, uh, diverse in this moment is not concentrated in one only possibility. That's the difference. Juan Gris is concentrated to elaborate a new possibility of cubism. And that's the difference when we both. Without doubt, this uh, landscape of Picasso is a masterpiece of Picasso. No? You can see it in Meadows Museum. No? It's, a, it's a wonderful, bit strange, but it's too scenographic, too, it's, uh, it's illusionistic. And Juan Gris is too, to, to several proportional, no? and it's, that's the difference. However, this duality is not permanent. It is true Picasso can be seen as having particular barrier or even discursive plastic objectives at this time, and that's Gris concentrate on the paradigm or model or second cubism. But perhaps Picasso, in other works, no many aspired to condensation and synthesis, as we can see in the 1915 still life on the Metropolitan. In any case, it seemed clear the cubism in the second life ha had its own distinctive model, of, although this model was resolved according to each part participant sensitivities. The second moment of cubism did have several antagonists. In the first place, as we can see from Christopher Green pioneer studies, the new cubism can face to face with Dadaists. But I think uh, we, we have to, to revise this, pos this position. Uh, in last time, I worked a lot about Vicente Huidobro, the poet, Chilean poet. And Vicente Huidobro was really a bridge between Tristan Sara and Juan Gris. In the letters of Juan Gris, published by my colleague Lola Jiménez Blanco, in the first moment, Juan Gris said, I'm afraid with Dadaism. But after that, Tristan Sara uh, write to Juan Gris and explain, uh, I love uh, your painting. I would like to do your contribution or our reviews. But this confrontation uh, between new cubism and Dadaism, I think we, we, we must to revise it. No? The second. Antagonist, or the second cubism also suffered an identity crisis when confronted by modern classicism or neorealism. Certainly, many of the leading actors of the second cubism movement began leaving cubism to develop figurative form considered to do today classicists of realists, like this picture of Messanger. No? 
But not much of one forget that for this artist, the figurative formulas they attended not mean a, re a rejection of cubism, but rather a formula of continuity. Cubism was already a powerful under underlying present in the figurative solution. They work on Metzinger and Severini even returned to cubism after their perspective realist and classicist periods. Uh, it's, I don't know why. Uh, this matter is not clear in art history about modern art. If you take the, ca the case of Matisse, you know the phobies, the Matisse phobism, uh, barely due two or three years. After that, Matisse changed. And Matisse is looking for the classicism. After that, Matisse changed another time. And at the end of his life, Matisse returned to Fourier's. No? That's the pro we, I think we, we have to understand, un un understand the process of modern artists to, 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 to understand the, this second cubism too. No? Uh, it's, I don't know why in the recent years when a cubist painter evolution to a figurative formula uh, near the classicism, we think that Raya renounced to cubist uh, formulas. No? It's not exactly that. They think, it's for, for us, it's very, very complex to, to understand that between cubism and between classicism, they are a, a strange connection. No? And it's normal the change for the other possibility. And the other strength of evolutive possibilities, Balmier and Glaze directed their second cubism towards an encounter with absolute abstraction. In the dynamics of modern art, notion stayed the same for a long time. The case of second cubism will not be different. We might even venture to say that then it was set quite differently to, differently to the way we see it today. Let us take an example. Let us look at the famous and influential review Les Trin Nouveau, venerated today as a perfect example of modern art criticism. From the pages of this review in 1921, an article written by the re renowned critic Valdemar George mentioned an important exhibit at Leon Rosenberg Gallery. Valdemar George hit this is her title, a group of a group exhibition. In the text, he explained the fundamental characteristics of what here today we have called second cubism or second life of cubism. The critic stated that this cubism had enabled the emergence of other possibilities that would have been incomprehensible without cubism itself. George's article is, is illustrated with reproduction of work, work that today is, they are very eloquent. Messenger, Picasso, Gris, Severini, Alban, Leger, and the others, no? Mondrian, too. At the end, what I thinking about that? At the end, I thinking, in 1921, from Osenfant, Jean Nere, Les Nouveau Review, the canon of modern situation in 1921, when they talk about cubism, they talk about a very big spectrum of possibilities. This spectrum of possibilities change after that. And we reduce the experience, the quiz experience, in a short, uh, in a short way of possibilities. But the second uh, look at the Spirit Nouveau possibilities was, in 1921, the reference to Latin American artists in the Spirit Nouveau disappeared. Why? Really, I don't know. Perhaps they disappeared from Europe and return to, 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 um, to America, so I, I don't know why, no? But we have a complex relation in three or four movements in, direction, in strange direction. One of them is the reduction of the cubist experience in a short time, in, in short possibilities, in adialect 
statistical, analytical, and synthetic. And the other is that supreme, a period of the art history, the period between 1914 and 1922 or 1923. Only Dada is a return to art exist. And the second movement to change the narratives is, if you look at uh, the reviews of this time, Norseed, Sikh, and the others, Latin American artists are princes in, the, in these reviews. But after that, in 1921, in the L'Esprit Nouveau pages, they disappear. No? Reconstruct this period is not only reconstruct the experience of Cubism, is reconstituted to the presence of Latin American artists in the funding the modern art. Okay, I think it's clear story. <laughs>